What have I done, Lord Jesus, to deserve Your endless love? What have I done, Lord Jesus, to be worthy of Your grace? What have I done, Lord Jesus, to be standing here with You? What have I done, Lord Jesus, to be worthy of You? For I am nothing yet You love me. I am no one yet You care. You thought of me when You died. What have I done to deserve? Jesus, to deserve Your endless love, what have I done, Lord Jesus, to be worthy of Your grace? What have I done, Lord Jesus, to be standing here with You? What have I done? Lord Jesus, to be worthy of You, You made me worthy of You. You made me worthy of You. Welcome to Soul Cafe Radio, where we cater food for the mind and soul. Please join us this hour for uplifting music messages and more and now to the rmg studios in miami gardens florida and your host the word master Hello and welcome to Soul Cafe Radio for Monday, November 22nd, 2021. Today on the program, we are starting a new series entitled the Galatians series. We'll be looking at Galatians chapter 4, 5, and 6. Today, also, we are doing something very unique. We are having one of my usual guests, Carl Baptiste, in the next segment with me after the song. You'll hear an interview we did, and he'll be talking this week his experiences as a teacher. As a teacher, he'll talk about the students, himself, his experience teaching, and the teaching environment that 
he's in. So, first of all, well, welcome to Soul Cafe Radio, each and every one of you that's listening. I pray by God's grace that today you would have been blessed, and as you get ready to hear the teachings for today, that your heart will be in tune with what God would have for you to learn. It is a prayer of my heart that all will be well during this time of teaching. So before we get into anything else, please join me as we have a word of prayer. Let's pray, Heavenly Father. Thank you so much for your loving kindness and your tender mercies. Thank you for doing, O Lord God, that which only you can. We love you, we praise you, and we give you all the praise, honor, and glory that's due to your name we pray. In Jesus' name, amen. So at this time, we'll transition into a song before we have the interview with Call. Stay tuned. This is Soul Cafe Radio. Food for the mind and soul. Bye. 
Okay, welcome back. So this week, we have an, this special segment where Carl is in studio with me for the next three days. And we're going to have a segment entitled, Lessons I've Learned as a Teacher. So today's question is, well, first of all, hello, Carl. How are you doing? Good afternoon. How are you? It's been a while since you've been here in yeah. the studio. Yes, a good while. So, so as you've heard in the program, we are doing this lessons on the book of Galatians. And yeah. we are going to, this week, focus on you as a teacher. So this week, we're looking at lessons that you've learned from your students or about your students, lessons you learned as a teacher yourself, and lessons you learned about the school system in general. So today, I just want you to talk to the audience about lessons you learned about the students, what you learned from them even, but mostly about them and what's it like this time, this you know, in this generation, teaching these young people? Oh, well, um, I've learned a lot. Um, I've observed many things from, you know, my children, my students. Because I am a middle school teacher. Uh, I specialize in science and social studies in sixth, seventh, and eighth grade. I work in a, a private school. And um, we mostly deal with, uh, you know, inner city kids, uh, you know, students who, you know, come from broken homes, students who come from single parent homes, students who actually even come from shelters. You know, their their parents are going through some serious trials and tribulations. So what I've learned uh, thus far, uh, you know, in this third month is that the school the school grounds are pretty much an emotional playground for our students. And um and I don't think I don't think they are aware of that because uh I don't think they, my students are aware that the emotions that they, they, they uh, I guess what I want to say, dispose of in school grounds is pretty much an outlet from what they experience at home, you know? They've never been, in my opinion, they, you know, based upon the things that I've witnessed as far as conduct-wise from various personalities, children, our, our children have not been taught how to constructively channel their emotions. You know, and to the point where they can um, learn how to use their emotions the right way and how to communicate with people. But I haven't, I, you know, I, you know, sadly, uh, based upon my observation, I haven't seen any, you know, that much of constructive, you know, uh, you know, you know, emotions from our from our children because a lot of them, they, you know, they they use. Uh, they use some foul languages, you know. The you know they they use foul languages. Um, uh, you know they I've been <laughs> disrespected many times. Uh, you name it. Uh, I've I've been challenged many times from these students, and um, to a point where I've had migraines. You know, um, you know I've had migraines. But um, my thing is, based upon my understanding, you know, in my aspect of it all, I think it's for the you know children in today's time. They, I don't think they have like a, not saying they, I'm not, I'm not basically, you know, you know, being biased towards all of them, but you know, some of them, you know, like they, you know, their, their conduct, their, you know, their conduct at, 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 at home, at school is a reflection of what goes on at home. You know, I don't, we don't know what goes on in the, in the mind of, of our children. We know our children are pretty smart and, you know, we know they know right from wrong and they're, and they know that there's a reason why they behave the way they do. Many other students conduct themselves because of peer pressure or popularity purposes, you know. But for the most part, um, it's a lot of, you know, the rebellion going on between, you know, student and teacher, you know. And um, that's mostly what I face. Okay, so, yeah, thank you. Um, what have you noticed between your generation of being a student and the student generation of today? What differences have you seen? What similarities have you seen? How can you compare the two generations, your generation and today's generation of students? My generation... Uh, Parents uh, uh, during my my youthful years were a lot stricter compared to today's time, where um, you know it wasn't against the law to physically discipline your child. You know, um, you know it wasn't against the law, or it was not viewed as um, as a uh, something villainous. You know, it right. wasn't viewed as something negative. It was viewed as something constructive. You know, um, you know back in the day when I was a kid in elementary school. You know, children used to get spanked right, you know, right on school grounds by parents when they would come to school. Back in the days when I was a kid, the teachers had every permission to spank you if you went out of hand. You know, and we were, you know, of course, we were on good behavior. 
And, you know, of course, back at that time, you know, technology was not as advanced. We didn't have social media, which was played a, a huge major role. And, you know, why, you know, we were not as bad as we were now, you know. Today's time, I feel like a lot of parents are trying to be their children's friend. True. You know, they're trying to be their friend instead of being their parent. You know, because I've called parents' house many times, and I don't see changes, you know, as much as with most of my students. So, you know, for me, that's particularly discouraging on my end, you know. Thank you. I, I feel you. So, see you back on tomorrow. Compassionate friend
Our scripture reading for the series is taken from Galatians chapter 6, Galatians chapter 1, excuse me, verse 6. It says, I marvel that ye are so soon removed from him that called you into the grace of Christ into another gospel. If you have access to the flyer that has been posted, you'll see our sub-theme for the series is Live in the Spirit. And this theme will come through over and over again throughout the series. After this item of music, we'll come back with our study for today, Galatians series, part 1, Galatians chapter 4, verses 21 to 31. Stay tuned. This is Soul Cafe Radio, food for the mind and soul. This week on the Galatians series, it is our fervent hope that you will live that experience. And by the experience, I mean allowing the Lord to work on you. In Galatians chapter 4, verses 21 to 31, we're introduced to an allegory. And this allegory is describing what the covenants are. And especially for those who are, I want to say, new to the faith. And even for seasoned Christians, there's been a misunderstanding of what the covenants are. And so this allegory seeks to describe, and in detail, and wonderfully so I may say, I remember distinctly, dear listener, when I first got introduced to this parable in Galatians 4. Galatians was one of those books that I never really got into, but as I got into it, I realized that I needed to have this experience because when I got into chapter 4 and went down to 21 and read those words, it blew my mind that So many people have a misconception of what the covenants are when the Bible so clearly describes it. In Galatians chapter 4, verses 21, the Bible says, Tell me, ye that desire to be under the law, do ye not hear the law? For it is written that Abraham had two sons, the one by a bondsmaid, the other by a free woman. And so... Well, let's go on to verse 24. But we who, but he who was of the bondswoman was born after the flesh, but he of the free woman was by the Spirit. Galatians 4.24 now picks up the allegory 
and let us know that it's an allegory in full detail. Which things are an allegory? For these are the two covenants, the one from the Mount Sinai, which gendereth to bondage, which is Agar. So, let us just begin by looking at not just the story itself, but let us examine the understanding from the Old Testament perspective. So, we come across in the Old Testament the story of Abram, and God calls him from the land of the Ur of the Chaldees and calls him to himself, and he makes a covenant with him. And there in that covenant, we see that God says, I will do this, I will do that, I will do this, right? And the Bible says that in Genesis 15, that Abraham believed God, and it was kind to him for righteousness. So Abraham, as we saw, began in faith. As our scripture reading said, that it's a faith experience that Abraham began with. It says, In Galatians chapter 1, let's get back there, Galatians chapter 1 and verse 6, the Bible says, I marvel that ye are so soon removed from him that called you into the grace of Christ unto another gospel. So, Abraham came on strong. He came out from among his father's household and step by step, progressively, did what the Lord would ask of him. And... Everything went fine for a little bit. But just like the Galatians, it could be said of Abraham, O foolish Abraham, who had bewitched you that he should not obey the truth before whose eyes Jesus Christ had been evidently set, before, set forth, crucified among you. So, are you so foolish, verse 3, having begun in the spirit, you are now made perfect by the flesh? This was Abraham's experience, brethren, God who called Abraham, and notice I've been saying Abraham instead of, I've been saying Abraham instead of Abraham, because that was Abraham's old name. But once he experienced the new covenant experience, he was now Abraham. But Abraham, having begun in the spirit, now came across the other participants in the lesson. Sarah, his wife, who said, you know what? It's been going on too long, Abraham, and we've been waiting for so long, we're not getting any younger. And so I believe that the best course of action is for you to fulfill this promise that God has given to you, Abraham, it has nothing to do with me. I don't remember him saying anything about me, he said, unto you, Abraham. So I'm giving you my maid, Hagar, to be your wife. And it may be that because she's a bondservant, her son will be free and he will be the promised son that God talked about. Maybe this is how God intended for this promise to be fulfilled. And so, without going to God for counsel, Abraham says, you know what, this seems good to me. And so, he goes into Hagar and produces Ishmael, the next person in our allegory. And so, we continue. Verse 25 and onwards. For this Hagar is Mount Sinai in Arabia and answers to Jerusalem, which is now, which now is, and is in bondage with her children. So, notice what it says that Hagar, the slave, was a bond servant. Her child, Ishmael, could not be free, so he was legally still a slave. And more than this, to the allegory, he was not the son of promise. He was the son fulfilled through the workings of the flesh and not through the operations of the spirit. Verse 26 goes on to say, But Jerusalem, which is above, is free, which is the mother of us all. Verse 27, and this harkens back to Sarah very beautifully. For it is written, Rejoice, thou barren that bearest not. Break forth and cry, thou that travailest not. For the desolate has many more children than she which had an husband. Talking about 
Sarah. And you would remember Isaiah chapter 54 talks about this. Isaiah 54, when you get a chance, go back and read it. Beautiful. And it says, Now we, brethren, as Isaac was, are the children of promise. So, here's a story. Abraham goes into Hagar. Hagar bears Ishmael. But, this is not the child of promise. So God comes back to Abraham and tells Abraham that, that he will have a son. For some reason, God does not acknowledge this child, Ishmael. And he says to Abraham, you will have a son. And Abraham says, oh, that Ishmael will live before you. In other words, just like Cain did, Abraham is seeking to produce his own offspring, his own works as something acceptable to God. But this can never do, friends. Only that which God produces, he accepts as the offering. Let us continue reading down towards the end before we conclude. Again, verse 28 says, Now we, brethren, as Isaac was, are the children of promise. But as then, he that was born after the flesh persecutes him that was born after the spirit. Even so, it is now. Nevertheless, what say the scriptures? Cast out the bondswoman and her son, for the son of the bondswoman shall not be heir, but the son of promise. So then, brethren, we are not children of the bondswoman, but of the free. So, let's get certain things out of the way. But, before we do that, let's pause for an item of music before we go on. This is the mind and soul. I stand before you guilty and unworthy. How can I be forgiven and holy? And I know I break your heart, but you promised I could start all over and all the things I've done. Place them each and every one into the sea of forgetfulness. You placed all of my sin, for I'm the one who keeps reminding you over and over again into the sea of forgetfulness. As far as forgetfulness You welcome me with open arms of mercy In spite of all I've done You still keep loving me And I only need to ask And you erase all of my past forever My debts have all been paid And they have all been washed away Into the sea of forgetfulness You placed all of my sin For I'm the one who keeps reminding you Over and over again Into the sea as far as he's from the west, seventy times seven, you've forgiven me, and you keep cleansing me and placing my sin into the sea of forgetfulness. It's your unfailing love that covers me and all my it's your steadfast love that keeps reminding me I'm forgiven. Into the sea of forgetfulness, you placed all of my sin. But I'm the one who keeps reminding you over and over again. Into the sea of forgetfulness, as far as. 
sail my sail into the sea. I'm forgetfulness. Before we continue, I just want to invite you to take a, what do you want to call it, an adventure into a very exciting book entitled The Powerful Messages of the Two Covenants. It will help you to understand in greater detail and in, at your own leisure a lesson that we don't have time to explore on today, which is the theme for today but it'll help you to understand in greater detail at your time the powerful messages of the two covenants. Visit truthinjesus.org, that's truthinjesus.org, and navigate to the book section, and it's on the list. The powerful messages of the two covenants. The powerful message of the two covenants. Truthinjesus.org. So, Galatians 4, as you said, from 21 to 31, is describing the experience of the covenants. So, we see that, first of all, the covenants are not, as the majority of Christianity says, it's not a dispensation of time. Even though we have our Bibles divided under that terminology, the Old Covenant period and the New Covenant period. Notice that even right here in Galatians, the Apostle says that we still have free and bond at this time. So, understand this. So, right off the bat, I want you to understand that the covenants, the covenant experiences are not dispensational. They are conditions and conditions of the heart. And that is one thing you'll learn from reading that book. Again, that book, The Powerful Message of the Two Covenants, truthinjesus.org, truthinjesus.org. Navigate to the book section. So, all covenant experience, as described there in Galatians 4, shows that it is the work of the flesh. Rather than walking in this, you're operating by the flesh. You are living according to your own self-righteousness, what you can produce. And in the time of Christ, the Pharisees and Sadducees, the Sanhedrin and all those religious leaders were examples and embodiments of living by the flesh. Those who followed Christ were seeking to live in the Spirit and to walk in the Spirit. And Christ, in John chapter 6, I believe, gave his greatest discourse on the matter, showing that it is not of the flesh that they should live, one, and it is not of their own works that they should live, two. So, speaking to the majority at large and to the Sanhedrin in detail, the Pharisees, the Sadducees, the religious leaders. So, the condition of the heart is like this. Old Covenant religion tells you that you have to do something to aid in your salvation. So, you'd have an example like the rich young man, or the rich young ruler as he is called. He would say, Good master, what good thing should I do to inherit eternal life? So, it is his performance that he is basing his salvation on. What should I do? And I want you to notice something, friends. I want you to notice something clearly. So I don't want you to get me mistaken. It says, tell me, you that desire to be under the law, do you not hear the law? So we're dealing with two different things, friends. We're dealing with a people who desire to be in bondage and not listening to what the law 
really says. And in looking at what the law talked about, we see the answer of what the law is really about. I just talked about three phases of law, but I only used that one word, law. So you could understand, friends, when a person would read Galatians and see all these things talking about law, they would get confused. Brethren, we'll talk about these as we go on. In fact, tomorrow, as we look at chapter 5, we'll pick it back and look at some of the things that chapter 3 talked about and see if we cannot just demystify some of this language. But I don't want to get too hot and heavy because we're getting to a point, we're getting to a purpose. This series on Galatians is designed as our subtopic, subheading says, to just impress upon your mind to walk in the spirit and not in the flesh. Friends, Old Covenant Christianity, Old Covenant Judaism, Old Covenant anything is bondage. Understand that God never intended for Israel to enter an Old Covenant experience. It was all to be new everlasting covenant relationship. It was always meant to be that experience in Ezekiel 36 from 25 to 27 where he says, I will, I will, I will. Philippians 1, 6, 2.13, 3.13, and 4.13 beautifully describes the experience, what God wants to do in us, for us. Because again, friends, what I bring, what I can produce, will never do. Old Covenant Christianity is one that is legalistic, performing the letters of the law rather than by living by the spirit of the law. So going back to the rich young ruler, he would say, well, Jesus would say to him, if you do this, don't murder, don't steal, and commit adultery on your father and your mother, so on and so forth, going down the list of the second table of the law, the last six commandments. He said, all of these I have kept from my youth. What lack is I yet? And Jesus answers, go sell all that you have, and you shall have treasures in heaven. And he could not. Why? Because he was literally living by the letter of the law. He was only doing so much so that his neighbors, his friends, his church family would not look at him as a lawbreaker, but as a law keeper. He was only doing so much to be looked upon in the eyes of society as a quote, unquote, fill in the blank, good person. Beloved, the spirit of the law goes way beyond that, and Jesus would have enunciated on it in Matthew 5. You have heard, you have heard, you have heard, said, but I say, but I say. And all throughout, he showed what the spirit of the law is. So, the letter of the law says, thou shalt not kill. But how many times a day do we assassinate a person's character? The letter of the law says, thou shalt not steal. And whether it's the paper clips from the office or a person's time, it is still theft and so on and so forth. But when Jesus said, sell all that you have, he was now hearkening back to that first tablet of the law, which says, thou shalt have no other gods before me. And so, here he was very much guilty because his gold and all his possession was in effect, and for all intents and purposes, his law, his his idols, his God, excuse me. So, as we wind down, I want you to understand, friends, that the covenants are these, like I said. Old covenant is righteousness by works. New covenant, righteousness by faith. Old covenant is gaining salvation through the works of the flesh. And, in fact, we hype up the works of the flesh. I witness ever so often. I read my Bible every day. I pray. I do this. I go to church. I 
I'm a good person. I, I, at the center of all covenant experience is I. And every time you see that, seeing that I, and make an I the center instead of Christ, you're living in Old Testament, Old Covenant Christianity. Many people who call themselves New Testament Christians are actually, in effect, Old Covenant, Old Testament Christians. They have not fully embraced the New Covenant because in the New Covenant experience, Christ is at the center, not self. How many people, supposedly, in New Covenant experiences get so offended easily? How many people in New Covenant experiences gossip and backbite and it's all about me? They hurt my feelings. They did this to me. The Bible says, not I, but Christ. One of those scriptures here in the book of Galatians, Galatians chapter 2 and verse 20. Beloved, the promise is, I will do this for you. This is the covenant. This is at the heart of the covenant experience God wanting to do for you, allowing God to do for you. And at the end of it, the Bible says that he who begun a good work in you will be able to complete it. He is the author and the finisher of your faith. Your works, even though they have a part to play in it, are not what guarantees you your salvation. Your works, friends, have their place, but at the end of the day, it is the work that Christ has done in you by his Holy Spirit that truly matters. Your works are just a manifestation that Christ has worked in you. All your good works. But remember, friends, even those good works Jesus has already condemned. Notice, some come to him and say, Lord, Lord, haven't we? Whether it's cast out devils, preached in your name, and so on and so forth. And he would have said, I know you're not. Depart from me that work iniquity. And the Bible says in Isaiah, all your righteousness, righteousness, not wickedness, all your righteousness is filthy rags. So beloved, understand without a shadow of a doubt that even all these things that you call good works can, in the nostrils of the Lord, be stink. It could be unsavory in his eyes, in his nostrils, in front of his face. Because God does not want what you can produce. He only accepts what he produces. So, beloved, as I close, I invite you, friends, if you have never really entered into a new covenant experience, I want you to question your experience right now. Because, you see, friends, the Bible says that there is a way that seems right to man, but the ends thereof are the ways of death. Can you imagine going along in this Christian walk, supposedly for 40, 50, 60, even 70 odd years, and then at the end of it all, be pronounced, I never knew you. Sisters and brothers, on this evening, I want you to go back and look at your salvation experience. See if you began in the flesh. See where you started, and then restart, friends. As long as you are in this moment, I believe that there's hope for you. As long as you have not pricked your conscience to the point of rejection, and I hope that even in listening now, that you'll begin to question. Again, check out that book I mentioned. I'll link it in the description after the live, and so it'll be available. So go back and study. Again, the book is The Powerful Message of the Two Covenants. It's on the website truthinjesus.org. Navigate to the book section and it's there in the list of books. Beloved, I appeal to you today to make sure, make sure, indeed, friends, that your calling and your election is sure. The only way you can do that, like I said, friends, is not by your works, but His. Truly, truly, if you believe that you're living the Galatian experience where you you are not in the Spirit, where you're not walking in the Spirit, friend of mine, I invite you to become now sons of Isaac, sons of the free women. May God richly bless you abundantly 
and I pray that ever after your experience will be such as that as you continue to live and move and your being you will see the good Lord working on you each and every day to produce he or she who he delights in. God bless you. This is Soul Cafe Radio. Let us pray, Father in heaven, thank you so much for being a God like no other. Today, first of all, Lord, I want to present to you those who, after listening to this presentation, will take a second look at Galatians chapter 4, 21 to 31, will take their time as they read and realize that you, O God, have never called the people into bondage. And so, the Old Testament experience that they once believed was all covenant was not what you designed for them to be, O oh God, where the people themselves said that all that you say we will do, which you never said for that to happen, O oh Lord God. Because all throughout, from Genesis to Revelation, all the work has been yours. You said that you are the author, the finisher, you're the alpha, the omega. You said he who began a good work will complete it. 
you've never asked us to do it. All that you've asked us to do is surrender. Heavenly Father, help us to realize that our cooperative role is to surrender. Thank you, Lord Jesus, for giving us this understanding today. I pray that souls would have been watered, souls would have been fed today on Soul Cafe Radio. I pray that every person who would have listened to this presentation, O oh Lord God, would truly go back and just question, even in this moment, Lord, Lord, am I in right relationship with you? Please, if not, O oh Lord God, please refine me and help me, O oh Lord God, to truly be in the right position with you, I pray. Bless, O oh God, bless your people, I pray. Those who are going through, I pray that you will help them to carry on and keep on keeping on, I pray. Give them the strength to maintain, O oh Lord God, as we wind down to the climax of 2021. Lord, may you continue to keep us faithful until the end, I pray. In Jesus' name, amen. Friends, just before we get off the air, I just want to put out this announcement. On Thursday, we'll be having a special live five-hour Thanksgiving special, and you can be a part of it. You can request songs, and you can dedicate songs. So you can also record an audio to submit or post a message on my direct message. It's Get in contact with me, whether leaving a voice note or just leaving a message. I want to give God thanks for and list a thank, or you want to say thank you to someone who has been influential to you this year. And you can request a song to be played following your dedication. We'll have more as the week unfolds, but I just want you to be having a heads up right now so that you can send in your requests and dedications and the deadline is at midnight on Wednesday. Midnight Wednesday. So again, send in your requests, dedications, and what you've been thankful for this year. May God bless you abundantly until next time. Tomorrow we'll be looking at Galatians 5 and the armor of God. See you then. Thank you for joining us today on Soul Cafe Radio. You've been listening to powerful music and messages for the mind and soul. Join us next time when we deliver more of the same. And remember to visit our website at www.soulcafeonline.org.